Welcome to Chimecast, where we break through and cut the BS in sports medicine, rehabilitation, and sports performance, and talk about how things really work. Welcome to Chimecast. I'm Tony Mikla. My guys, here's Evan Hauger, Aaron Crouch, Russ Dunning. So let's take you through what we're going to talk about today. Our, our main uh, objective today is we're going to talk about this inflammatory phase and working with patients in this early process when you see them coming in maybe in an acute pain phase. Could be any sort of injury, uh, certainly a soft tissue one is a kind of a prominent one that we're seeing in the sports medicine field. But let's talk about the the process of this and the, really the considerations. And I think there is there's a lot of media around this right now. There's a lot of interest. So let's wrap it up and kind of get this con- condensed as to things you can really use and make it really clinically relevant. But before we get started, Evan, what are we drinking today? We pre-opened it this time, so we don't have any disasters. Um, this is a this is called Bad Habit. It's an Abbey Ale from uh, Jack Rabbit Brewing Company, which is in West Sacramento. So another another good local grab. Yeah, I like it. I'm not 100 percent sure what an Abbey Ale is, but let's find out. Expert, I feel bad about it. It's six percent. Let's, uh, let's yeah, find out. Let's go. <laughs> but it's a it's a great prelude, and what we're about to talk about yeah. bad habit yes. lifestyle factors. Yeah. Oh Drinking man. Too much. He's getting Powerful. hot. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, beer expert, I haven't said beer yeah. expert. Did you hear that part? Yeah, let's reduce let's inflammation with some beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you had something there, uh, Russ, where you said um, just bad habits, right? And um, I think it's such an overlooked aspect to dealing with our clients. Um, and you really don't understand those bad habits until you connect with them. And I think you don't, you don't really get to it on the first day you get to it after a, a few sessions and certainly after maybe a, an extended period of time or relationship building but it's absolutely something you have to zero in on because it affects their healing affects their their progress and there's so many things you can you educate them on and, and tools you can give them to try to master it yeah no doubt about it. so one thing that we see uh, obviously with inflammatory conditions and it could be you know anything post-operatively or it could be something more of acute injury or, or it could be something frankly that's been relatively chronic in my opinion I think you see the same thing. When we look at inflammation, the science of it hasn't really changed all that much. You know, it's really been the same. You have a three to five day inflammatory window, and yet you see clients all day long that are in pain much longer than five days, that they're having swelling much longer than five days. So so why is that happening? Why are we having this this recurrence of, of symptoms? If you really kind of limited and controlled variables and we got it down, I mean, the science suggests pretty strongly that this inflammatory process should be a very short window of time, but yet we see it oftentimes carried out uh, much, much, much further. So maybe they re-inflame themselves, which happens often. They get a little confident, get a little better, and then re-aggravate. Or maybe they, uh, we maybe we push too hard in, in, in rehab or push too hard in strength and conditioning where they end up flaring up. And I think that we got to take some ownership of that as clinicians to, you know, did we cause some inflammatory process? Maybe we didn't hurt them. Maybe we really caused the inflammatory process, which ultimately will slow down the thing. So consider that in, in the progression. And then, of course, maybe what are they doing on their own? You know, maybe maybe it comes down to a variety of factors. So we look at a variety of variables, and I worked uh, closely with, with Scott Pelton, who's uh, phenomenal, wrote, wrote a book called Sink, Float, or Swim, and he really focuses on executive function and, exe- and working at an elite level and maintaining success for, for a long period of time. And uh, he was working with the Oakland Raiders and brought me in. We did a lot of uh, testing with the Oakland Raiders, actually the, the coaching staff, as opposed to the, the team and the player side. And we really looked at this this aspect of of recovery, of of lifestyle, and all these other variables that really impact their their quality and their their you know their success in their life and their, their pain levels in many ways. So it's really cool. So big things that we're looking at, of course, are, are really sleep. So there's really not much debate at this point in the game about sleep being a top variable that's really going to impact healing rates and and recovery. Uh, stress is obviously massive, and I think we've just always everyone's talked about that medically forever that you know your stress is. It impacts you, but the question is, of course, how and how much. You've got uh, nutrition, which again I think is you know maybe brushed over and probably the big missing art in in our field of rehabilitation and, and physical therapy and overall sports medicine, but also high end performance that 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 can and should be addressed heavily. And then of course movement. So how are you moving? What are you doing? What are you doing cardiovascularly? Are you are you sitting still and you're being chilling, being more stagnant? And if so, you know, how's that impacting your, your overall outcome, your healing potential and how well you're doing? So let's pick apart doing some of these uh, segments. And there's, there's another piece of that movement thing though. And I think if we're talking about the inflammatory process, it's 
it's maybe also what are they doing that they shouldn't. So I always come back to this like scab and like this picking the scab process. And mm -hmm. I use that for them because it's, you know, it's a gross visual, but I think people kind of get that is that one of the, so we can die, you can dive into all these other, these other components of stress management and sleep and all that. But the reality is there might be like one mechanical thing that they're doing or a few mechanical things that we're doing. That if we take that away, that it gives their body the, the, the chance to, you know, stop picking the scab and then their normal physiologic process can take over and do it. So I think that's another that's another piece of the puzzle, and I usually try to get to that component before I even get down these other these other these other paths of things. Yeah, I think you can't can't ignore that fact that they, you know, as as a patient, they tend to kind of reaggravate often, and and oftentimes we'll explain it to them. I'll use a curve uh, strategy, suggesting you know all of us want to have this linear progression, right? And always getting better every day, right? But this is not a reality. The reality is in the way just periodization and and tissue adaptation works is you're going to have some improvements probably exponential at some point and then you're going to have some sort of a a plateau or possibly a bit of a decline and then a super compensation curve where we get better right so it's never a very rarely linear process it's usually up with a bit of a down movement up again a bit of a down movement and and actually those things can be fairly predictable especially if these variables are controlled but when they're uncontrolled it, it becomes more of this random line and you get people that are relatively stagnant and that's what really talking about getting out of is shaking that that's that stagnant curve. I think on on that note of the of of the picking the scab and like looking at the movement quality, I think one thing we see too on the on the counter side to that is that people just physiologically don't don't move as much, right? So we have to figure out what is the physiological movement that's safe for them. And for example, like on a hip scope or hip arthroscopy with a labral pair. You know, they can't walk very much, even though we all kind of, the first thing you want to go is get back off the crutches and get walking. But I found in my, my time with them and, and through all the protocol work is, you know, walking early or walking often is a negative thing. You know, certainly some weight on it and such for those first six weeks is critical. But the, once they get off the crutches, the more they walk, the more inflamed they tend to get. But if you get them on a bike, an upright bike and, and get them to do some spin work, it's a phenomenal relief. They do really, really well. So it's just a subtle change of I want you doing physiological work. Let me to ride the bike for 20, 30 minutes, get that physiological base going, get your heart rate going, break a sweat. But biking is the way to do it as opposed to walking. And it's, it's a subtle thing that you wouldn't think might might set them off. But I've seen that very consistent in that population, at least as, as an example. So I think finding that the right physiological balance and getting the person sweating at the end of the day, uh, especially early on in the process, if no matter what the injury, if possible, is valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it, it comes down to when someone's not healing well, when they re, when they have a recurring aggravation or, you know, maybe they are seven days, 10 days, 14 days post-injury and they're still in a lot of pain. We really have to dive deep and in exactly what you said, uh, Tone, with kind of looking at those lifestyle factors and looking at the uh, potential of aggravation through chronic posturing or just something you're doing that you really shouldn't be doing. And that, that questioning is hard. You know, it, we uh, we can get personal and intimate in a hurry. Once you start talking about someone's sleep, then you go into their emotional status and you ask why they're stressed. You better be ready for some shit. You know, you're going to hear of some lost loved ones. You're going to hear of a divorce. You're going to hear of a problematic relationships in their life or they're on the brink of losing their job. And it gets real in a hurry when you ask a powerful question. You know, I, I tend not to ask this on day one, but if things aren't going smoothly, then we got to get deep. Because, you know, frankly, healing is really coming down to blood, oxygenated blood. You need to breathe well. You need to do the right things for your own physiology. You have to have the right nutrition. And, and that goes right into the plethora of vitamins, the phytonutrients and fruits and vegetables, and some good hydration. And if you don't have that, then we're going to have some problems. Even stress management. So I think to kind of bring this into like a real situation, it reminds me of several patients that I've had. I'm sure we've all had. And anyone listening has ever had if they've noticed it but you know one one lady comes into mind and and it was a post-op situation subacromial decompression a simple surgery really to recover from assuming that you got all the right uh, physiological markers and you're not you know unhealthy at baseline and everything else um she wasn't making the right progress that you should make from a range of motion range of motion standpoint week one week two week three and it was just kind of you know I can move your arm. Why can you not move your arm from your side? It's almost full range, 80% of range, passive range of motion, yet her arms pinned to her side as if it's, it's immobile or stiff or frozen. You know, it's kind of like racking your brain on, okay, what is it about the, the plan or the, or the strategy here that's not allowing us to get from point A to point B? And 
that's when you start diving a little bit deeper and understanding what else is going through their life. And as much as we're the, the rehab, uh, musculoskeletal specialist, a sports medicine specialist, we think in many moments we become the life coach. We're like the one singular health professional that's going to spend the most amount of time with them and give them the time they need to really kind of dive deep. And for this one individual, she single mom, uh, both kids in high school, uh, one being bullied, another one uh, kind of finding his way as well and being dragged back and forth and, and understanding she's not hardly putting five minutes to herself in this recovery process at home because she's tied in so many other directions and really can't put herself as a center focus for at least five minutes in a day. And so really kind of I, discovering that that stressor that's limiting her ability to reduce anxiety, to come out of sympathetic drive, to reduce inflammation on a consistent basis was kind of like the key that unlocked um, her, her deficits where we kind of made a huge jump just in a week, just, just by simply having a conversation, coming with a tangible strategy in the already somewhat chaotic life she has to manage by herself. So, I mean, highlighting, that's, that's a great story. Highlighting like one key thing you said there that I think is just so critical. That's probably missed in a lot of places and many other you know components of the medical world is missed. We have more time with them. And that's one thing this business was set up with to create was a clinician with more time with people. So you do, you end up in the scenario where you have more time with them. You can dive deeper. You end up being their life coach. They tell you things that, you know, I've heard, I've heard things about people I probably didn't want to hear, <laughs> <laughs> right? We, they, people end up telling, telling us things like the kind of some deep, dark things sometimes that yeah, you end up helping them through it. You, you know, if you're, if it's a post-op rehab, you might see them two or three times a week for an extended period of time. They might see you more than, you know, some of their closest friends. So, um, yeah, that, that becomes a pretty close relationship in that. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. I got a, I got a guy uh, just comes to mind that we already had him last year as a back pain, a, a back pain guy. And he's out of the blue, ended up with this terrible back pain. He actually works at a lawyer, uh, works in a downtown firm. And, you know, at first he came with back pain. He's really out of the blue. He had no sense of it. He is a, a runner, active cyclist, like active person, healthy, not overweight, uh, all that. Kind of came out of the blue, hadn't had a history of back pain. Ended up with this uh, terrible back pain, like a little bit of leg pain going with it, which, you know, you think mechanical symptoms and we go through our process and, and going through it, it's kind of like, yeah, this is, it's obviously very guarded and, and the nervous system was very on point. It was on edge, uh, which you see in the legal community is common because they, they work so hard for such short windows of time. Like they, um, they'll, they'll go from a 72 hour, 72 hour rage to just like finish a project before they go to court or something. And you see this kind of symptoms pop up oftentimes. Things like frozen shoulder, back pain, things like that are common there. But anyways, this um, this happened to him. And, you know, I asked him and the first day, I'm like, is anything changed in life that would cause this? Anything come to mind that might, might trigger this because there wasn't any mechanical reason. And, you know, he couldn't think of anything at the time and no big deal. And we went through a session and did some work, did some really sympathetic, decreased uh, focus stuff, you know, some some deep pressure work uh, that was tolerable. We did some cupping, with some easy motion with an available, with an available range to really make it uh, comfortable for him to move. And that was, uh, that was, that was all good. Maybe made just some very, very mild improvements. And then on day two, I kind of asked him again, does anything really change like at work in your environment? And he's like, yeah, he goes, I actually just got promoted about two weeks ago to this new job. And I'm pretty concerned about it. It's a big jump from what I'm doing. I've got a lot to catch up on before I go. And there's a lot of stuff I haven't really done before in there. It's like, like, that's it. That's, mm -hmm. that's your trigger to why, you're, why your back hurts mm -hmm. is that the stress component that's really, you know, tough to put your head around is like, why is this happening? What's going on? But but whatever that was, that was enough to trigger this response. The, the nervous system drives sympathetic. There's a little bit of tweak to the system and boom, it just, it sets off. And the great news is he did great. Um, when he first pretended he couldn't even stand up straight, his back was in so much pain. Uh, within three or four weeks, we had him back to his prior level of function. He was doing well. So it was a pretty fast recovery which speaks also to this idea of the, of the nervous system. If you can get this thing calmed down and understand that at the end of the day, we are, we are treating, whether it be in the weight room or in the PT field or in, in many forms of, of coaching, we're always treating the nervous system first. And I, I think that's, that's something that we tend to look past often is looking things at a mechanical phase. Look at that nervous system first and, and see how that's affecting us. If that's, if that's in sympathetic mode, the person can't really learn very well. They're not going to sleep very well. Their stress level is going to be high. They're probably going to be binge eating. So you've got all of those boxes checked. Nutrition is poor, sleep's poor, et cetera. So there's some big markers out there that, that you guys can shoot for that are, that are really, you know, well-documented. The science is just ridiculous now. Um, 
you you see this whole thing about readiness and all the work on readiness and what that means and you know there's a lot of stuff on HRV that we think is really valuable as as far as speaking to readiness as well but at the end of the day when you look at readiness you look at how you measure readiness there's some debate there but there's are some constants and, and one of them is sleep and we're looking for sleep in the adult population to be seven hours plus so we're looking for if you you need to be seven hours plus and the evidence behind that is extremely sound so it's not really even debatable at this point as to whether that's needed or not if you have less than that you're like the of, of disease or other injury is, is, is significantly high which which we know because we know that fatigue is one of the number one factors for, for producing injury so obviously not sleeping well it's going to be an issue i think nutrition has a little bit less uh less clarity to it we use a couple of strong themes in nutrition that i think are really valuable and, and simple so one of the things is uh when when looking at food is eat the rainbow so eat a variety of colors and a variety of options to give yourself this multi ingredient ingredient option so you, you get a good balance of nutrients another concept would be to uh, shop the perimeter of the grocery store so i think this is such a super uh, super simple uh tip but really really valuable to be like hey just stay on the perimeter of the grocery store stay on the perimeter that's where all the good stuff is right you know, be a little careful you get to the the beer and wine section <laughs> and that's the wines usually on the perimeter you know, hops and grapes though yeah. hops and grapes yeah, it mm -hmm. might be organic but it's still it's still not okay um Alcohol is one of the worst things you can do uh, for your body, as we talked about our, our beer selection here today. This one's this one's okay. Um, in short, in short, in short, uh, consumption can be can be okay, but at the end of the day, it's one of the biggest factors of, of disease in the future. So keep that in mind. But uh, primarily, grocery stores where all your fresh fruits and vegetables are, fresh meats, uh, even even the dairy products that are appropriate for those folks. Uh, there's lots of good stuff there. The second you go down a middle aisle your chance of making a bad decision just went through the roof, right? Everything's in a box or a bag and, and such. Uh, so that gives some, some basic nutrition. One more nutrition tip would be uh, on a protein source. So we use an easy concept to say the less legs, the better. So less legs, the better be that fish is probably your best source of protein, chicken and turkey being second on the list, and then your your four-legged animals being your your next best option for, uh, for protein sources. So, of course, with fish would be vegetables as well as a protein source, which is been shown to be really, really positive in many ways. So you can see some nutrition stuff, some pro some um, some sleep stuff. Uh, of course, stress management is a little bit tricky, but I'd be able to identify the stressor. We look at stress as, was it a physiological stress? Was it an emotional stress? Was it a financial stress? Was it a workplace stress? Uh, where does that stress come from? And, and maybe start to just look at what category it's in. It's not our job necessarily to fix that in our field, but I think to recognize it is incredibly important because it's going to determine where you go and, and how you take that person. But at the end of the day here, I think um, one thing to talk about is this idea of, of looking at stress and sleep and those things. And one way to measure that is really looking at heart rate stuff. So we use a test for, for our adult population and, and, and our youth population, frankly, and it's really a good one we use. We kind of wanted a test that almost anybody can do and we wanted to get to a maximum heart rate. And we've, we've learned over the years that certainly athletes know what it's like to work hard. So getting them to work hard and do sprints, you can get a max heart rate. It's not that difficult. You can do a VO2 max test and that's great. We've learned with the adult population is sometimes the concept of working hard is a bit debatable of what that might actually mean. So we developed a test using a sled where they had to push a sled, which is an in inherently hard work, and then do it for five minutes. So... The goal was to do it five minutes, but if you're done at two minutes, that's fine. We'll, we'll take it. <laughs> that's the test. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. I think, again, the, mag, the goal was max heart rates. So we want to get to the point of failure here. So we do that and we look at recovery strategies. So what was the max heart rate achieved at the time of failure, at the time of uh, stoppage at five minutes? And then what was the recovery heart rate look like at, at two minutes and at five minutes? And the data here is really tremendous. Uh, uh, Russ has yeah. the best info here on the, on the data, but it's really tremendous on speaking to people's really stress management and what's their baseline, you know, which, which we talk about as a base of our pyramid, but what's their baseline function. I, it, what amazes me is, is this research is, is several decades old and stands the test of time. And I think we can get lost in new tech. HRV is definitely new tech. And you, you look at the readiness score that your watches and, and your wearables give you, but you look at a heart rate profile and, you know, this is something that was done in the 70s and 80s at a really high level. You know, you read a book by a Phil Moffatone and you realize there was a lot known many decades ago that still is sound today. So if you take a few heart rate measures and you can do this at home with any wearable or just counting your pulse for 30 or 60 seconds, you get your heart rate at rest. First thing in the morning before you get out of bed, get a nice heart rate. 
If it's sub 60, you're doing pretty good. Don't let the old textbooks fool you here where they say 60 to 100 is normal. If you're less than 60, you're doing pretty good. If you're north of 60, it's hopefully by not that much. So that's heart rate at rest. Now we want to see what you can do with some capacity like Tony was alluding to. So you do a five minute test or a three minute test, something that's low skill, but allows you to work hard, preferably using most muscles in your body. We love the sled. You could use an assault bike. You could use a kettlebell swing. You could use really a lot of skills. You just want to use the more muscles, the better, and the more low skill, the better, because you don't want to hurt yourself doing the test. So you take yourself to some three, four, five, a uh, maximal uh, five minute test at a maximal effort, and you get your heart rate max. The separation of those two is called your heart rate reserve. That separation should be 90 beats. For many of us, even people close to ages of 55, 60, 65 years can still get a separation there. So if you have a resting heart rate of 60, you should be able to get your heart rate up to like 140, 150. And, and for a young athlete, they should blow that out of the water. It's not unheard of that a high-level athlete will have a heart rate, believe it or not, at around 35 to 40, especially if they're a super aerobic, uh, an aerobic athlete. They might have a heart rate at rest at 40, and they might have a maximal heart rate at 200. Now you have 160 beat separation. That's that heart rate reserve. So we look at that. We want that. That's going to show a, a flexible, mobile, agile heart that can respond. It can de-stress and regenerate and relax to the best of us, and it can raise the roof and more uh, at a very high level and get good oxygenated blood everywhere through the body to do the, to do the task at hand. Then after that maximal effort, so we see what your heart rate can do at that maximal effort, which is a function of strength and tolerance and all the good things that we have in our, in our bulletproof progression. And we look at what does your heart rate do after that effort? And that heart rate recovery has some gold to it. And if you take any person, you take them through a three, four, five maximal effort test, five minute test. Um, and if their heart rate doesn't budge much, say it only goes 10 beats, you took them to a, a heart rate of 140 with a three minute test. And if one minute later they have less than a 10 beat drop, that is a massive red flag that they have a, a heart condition coming down the line very, very soon. Their morbidity skyrocketed because of that poor heart rate recovery. So we want that heart recovery to be maximal. Now, you already know uh, that I love UFC fighting. And what I love about fighting is these guys do a five-minute all-effort test. They get one minute to recover. The guy who knocks out people in the, third, in the beginning of the third round just recovered 10 times better than the other guy. And that's why he could land a crisp hook right to that guy's chin. It's, it's a complete measure of how well can you respond with one minute rest and then be at your best that very next second. So, but for the general public, this is a fantastic way of looking at how good shape are you in? What is your heart rate to after a maximal effort? And we're looking, I, I think a, a person that's in good condition can do a five minute test. You can even run for five minutes as long as your heart rate gets really, really high. And then you look at what your heart rate does one minute, one minute post, and it should drop about 40, 50 beats. If you do two minute, it should be 60, 70 beats. If it's five minutes, it definitely should be sub 100, even getting close to your resting heart rate. And that is an agile heart. It's a really uh, phenomenal way of looking at your own physiology. And this is probably the best way of looking at our longevity. How long you wanna live? Let's look at aerobic capacity. Nothing else beats that measure unless you want to, you know, measure some negative effects like, you know, do you ride a motorcycle or do you skydive? You're probably not going to live that long. But, but if you want to look at maxim, maximizing your place on this earth, look at your aerobic function. Look at your heart rate. I think to kind of like summarize, I think for listeners and those that want to improve themselves and, and other clinicians or coaches that want to improve a, a clientele base, I think that the conversation is, it could be so broad, but then to tailor it is where the, the power is. And I think what we've done in our own education for our own curriculum is to create this human pyramid, which we've alluded to a couple of times subtly. And for uh, the people listening, if you can kind of envision in your mind what the human pyramid would look like, it's, it's just a simple pyramid or a triangle and layered in three different spots. So um, the base of the pyramid is what we've been talking about this whole time that consists of uh, good nutritional habits, great sleep habits, great stress control habits, and this idea of, of a, an amazing aerobic system that can have a, a variability with, with heart rate with various situations. 
the middle layer of that pyramid would then be the movement category, which I think most of us movement specialists want to influence the most or where we feel like we have the most amount of knowledge and what we'll jump to as a default. And then the top of the pyramid for everybody is, including ourselves, is the perform. And that's what your clients want to do. And so we have the responsibility to not only understand where they're failing in the movement category, but also where they're failing in the base of the pyramid. And so um, some tangible strategies that we've given here to identify where the people uh, fail that you work with, understand that there is a kind of a methodical way of going about it, of identifying a, um, a, a deficit in the base of the pyramid and the middle of the pyramid to help them get back to their goals. Yeah, I think that's great. The uh, I think the, the thing about this is that the bottom of the pyramid stuff is not sexy. It's all like, you, it requires discipline and consistency and it's all like these basic things that everybody really knows they're supposed to do, but they're not doing for whatever reason. I think the, the question, maybe this is a can of worms, we can curb this if we want to, but the, the question that I get a lot here is people looking for shortcuts, right? Well, mm -hmm. what's, what's my way around this? Like, you know, Da Vinci had that, that sleeping thing where you'd sleep for 20, 20 minutes or something and then wake up for a few hours. Or I don't know. So that's like a way around that. And I think Tim Ferriss talks about that in one of his books. But the, the question I get here all the time is, is, um, is supplements. Do you guys get that question a lot? Supplements? All people the time, always, baby. Always all the time. So in the, all these complex systems of this crazy thing that I've, you know, half the time never heard of half the things they're, they're mentioning here, but I think there are some basic things that, that we could potentially stand behind. What do, what do you guys, what do you guys throw out there that when people ask about supplementation? Well, I think the one gold standard is it was true. First thing is eat for, you know, let's eat yeah. healthy yes. first. Right? Get it it yeah. So to, to get it, get it naturally first and foremost. And I think the, the non-debatable area here is probably fish oil. Mm -hmm. We've seen that from a tissue standpoint, from a brain function standpoint, uh, fish oil seems to be pretty non-debatable. And, and I, I, you know, my understanding is that krill oil is probably the best uh, of that, of that variety that, that you can move with. So we see that quite a bit. And I think that's the one, that's one supplement that I, that I would recommend. Uh, yeah. off the cuff. And that, right, that speaks to the fat profile, the lipid profile of an individual and going back into going deep into the omegas. But that's also why we, we have a preference of fish and, and then some fowl and, and then some, you know, four legged animals. But if you are going to pick the fowl and the four legged animal, there is a different fat profile. There's a, there's a better enrichment of the proper omegas in the more organic grass fed. They're just going to have it better. So that goes into fat. You dial in your fat. You dial in some some anti-inflammatory capability in your body and, and a healthy nervous system. And I think a lot of people probably underconsume protein also. So and in, especially athletes that maybe don't eat certain types of meats or maybe that are vegan. We've had a couple of those come through. And um, then protein supplementation could be something that's that's reasonable because it's that's completely required for everything you're going to ask for them tissue building and, and, and repair requires requires protein available and then and that's inflammation management yes, and then that correct, goes right into right. hydration and vitamin c hands yep, down yep. not that we should be pounding vitamin c but right. we need to go back to the phytonutrients in the color of the rainbow mm -hmm. eating the right uh, fruits and vegetables that enrich a vitamin c because without it research is so solid here you do not heal anywhere close than if you don't uh, th then if you do have an enrichment of that yeah i, th I think on your uh on your point there with, uh, with just the different supplementation, obviously the, the fish oil and stuff is our number, number one factor. The, um, the naturals, turmeric, ginger. Yeah. Turmeric, ginger, and also great anti-inflammatory options as well. And we'll use those, uh, we we'll use it extensively as well. I think those are, those are good kind of natural options. The goal here in this conversation was to really talk about, you know, inflammatory components. And we kind of alluded to here at the, at the end of the of nutrition. Uh, but we think about stress, sleep, nutrition, you get those things dialed in and some physiological aerobic capacity. That's what's really going to take your nutrition or going to take your, your ability to tolerate inflammatory markers and really produce them and, and have a healthier outcome. So I think that all of these were, were small, small strategies. Our job as a clinician is always when you are a life coach in some way is to take the client you're working with and find out what is the deficit? Is it one of these categories? Is it all four of these categories? Is it two of the categories? And that's really the space that, that you want to focus in and, and spend your time with. I think that's the art of this because we could all rattle off like, oh, all this stuff's great, but you're not going to change all four of these things in one day with your client either. So keep that in mind that what's the area that you want to focus on? What do you see as the low-hanging fruit that, that we can address first and foremost? 
and maybe we can be more detailed about things that are that are done okay, but we can we can improve them. Yeah, well, I think what people fear is especially when you talk about aerobic capacity, they think, uh, well, I I don't do a lot of aerobic work, and that's just me. And and they forget that you can have a rapid response here. You start if you start walking right now and walk thirty minutes every day, it's amazing how fast. It works. Your heart responds really quick. So we're not talking about, you know, you have to be an endurance athlete to heal well. You just have to do the right things and let your body respond appropriately. And, and that is, you know, dives into a deeper concept of delayed gratification. But we have to not be afraid of putting the deposits in the right track and, and get moving in the right direction. And, and that goes back to that phrase of what are the things to do that really move the needle? with this rehabilitation and conquering inflammation and regenerating tissue is wrapped up in that singular concept. Yeah, yeah. I love that about the protein. I think that's so huge. It's, we talk about a lot in strength and condition, like let's you know get the protein source, get the fuel in the body to heal, well, when, or to, to grow tissue. Well, what are you trying to do when you heal? Your objective here too. Yeah, you got an injury strain, you got a muscle strain, you got a, a tissue repair after surgery, you gotta get the protein source in you. So supplementation there is, is great if you're not getting it naturally. First off, get it naturally, but afterwards, strong consideration. Yeah. I think it still segues into our, our favorite question, just in a gentler form. Like, what the fuck are we doing? What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's simply just don't avoid the elephant in the room. 100%. You don't have to be the expert, but you better address it. These are simple strategies. And if you don't feel confident enough as a clinician or a coach or someone, then then don't let it, don't brush it underneath the rug. Like, Provide them a resource so they can have an answer. Don't be afraid to refer out. I think we've, we've talked about, you know, we see people that failed other places and invariably these failures in other places is a lack of attention to, to this, this category of stuff. Yeah. yeah if you, you if you have an athlete coming in and they got dark circles under their eyes and they're, they're deep in some ACL rehab, don't do lunges in jumping mechanics. No. They've got, they got bags under their eyes. Yeah. Start to have a stronger conversation about their study habits and what time are they going to bed? We have to not avoid the elephant in the room. What's the limiting factor on this day? Not, not new. This is back to the progression and you've got this big protocol. You've got to meet all these marks and all our tests we've talked about before, but yeah, you got to get the limiting factor on that given day. And if it's sleep, then. All right, Joe. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the next episode. This was Kimecast, and we are the Kime Human Performance Institute. Thank you very much for listening. We'd love to continue the conversation with you. Please hop on our social media. It's at KimeHPI and engage with us there. If you'd like us to feature a topic or answer any questions live on the show, post your comments there. You can also check us out on our website at KimePerformance.com, and there you can see links to content that we've posted throughout our podcast for more information.